I would refer um, you and people who might be listening to the Western Center on Law and Poverty uh, .org website, where our um, that's where our 26-page analysis of Prop 98 um, resides. WCLP org and then just follow the prompts and you'll you'll find the prop 98 there's also a an article that was done in uh, one of the legal journals uh, within the last couple of weeks it's a very brief one by Western Center but it's also um, posted up there um, what we found in the analysis is that clearly um, rent control is prohibited. Um, you can, no locality could enforce their rent control ordinance except for those people that continue to reside there. Um, the uh, Prop 98 is very clear in that regard. The, it's also clear that the inclusionary programs would also be prohibited since the way in which the inclusionary units are made available to uh, or made, affor made affordable to lower income families is through a control of the rent on the units or a control of the sales price on the units. Um, the way in which um, Prop 98 achieves this is that the the clause that determines what constitutes a taking has been expanded to cover the limitation on what a private owner may be required to uh, either rent or sell their property for. Um, we are uh, looking at that in the context, in our opinion, of many of the kinds of um, tenant protections that exist today that do require um, a taking within, potentially a taking within that very, very broad definition. Um, clearly, 98 and its application to tenant protections on some of the lesser um, kinds of ordinances and tenants rights will end up in the court for quite some time. Well, I, if I recall correctly, I think it was the legislative analyst that had, that had in, indicated that it would, it would end rent control forever, prospectively. Correct. And, and then there's the, <coughs> that it very likely uh, would s severely limit local jurisdictions, for example, just cause uh, protections that tenants have. And, 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 and if I put those two things together, it sounds to me like, you know, some unscrupulous landlord can come up with any excuse or any reason, evicted long-term tenant, uh, and they don't need to show just cause. They can just do it if this initiative becomes law. And then those units after that will forever be market rate or whatever the market will bear. That's the uh, conclusion that we reached in our opinion as well, that on June 4th, if, the, if 98 did pass, that just cause eviction would end immediately, and it would only be the tenants in the rent-controlled units that could remain, but there would be nothing that would, in our opinion, prohibit a landlord from evicting the tenant because the just cause ordinance will no, would no longer enumerate um, the narrow list of reasons for which a person could be evicted. So we think for purposes of um, both uh, residential rent control and mobile home rent control that um, the possibility for an end of rent control two months from night is very, very possible. It sounds like to an unscrupulous landlord, they could, many of them will be serving eviction notices within days after the initiative passes. And the, and the consequence of doing that is that even if a subsequent court action determined 
that rent control, because of the Birkenfeld decision, still had to be part of the unit for rent control to, mean, to remain viable. If that were the subsequent decision of the court, the fact that all of those tenants had been evicted, those units are immediately decontrolled and they're never subject again. So I would think that the various apartment associations would be certainly educating their members to say if tenants are gone, there's no dispute about that unit any longer. Wow. Possibly damages to the tenants, but what are they on the in the scheme of gaining um, a completely decontrolled unit? Well, in our city, if I recall correctly, from the last report we had at the last meeting, we had somewhere around 12,606, if I remember correctly, uh, long-term tenants, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. 13,000 possibly? Maybe it's 13,000. And, and um, you know, what, what just strikes me is, is so tragic about all this is our city is spending lots of money and coming up with plans to try and build affordable units or, or units for, for middle class residents like teachers and firefighters so that they can live in our community rather than having to commute to hours uh, per day in order to come here and work. And you know, here we have a tried and true way to maintain middle class and affordable housing, which you know, because of this initiative could just be eliminated. Uh, overnight. And Indeed. <laughs> um, um, we have also looked at the fact that even relocation benefits, um, all of these kinds of benefits that even slightly ease uh, the difficulty when, when a family suddenly finds that they no longer have the rent control protections. Um, the Ellis Act, as as difficult it is to look at those numbers, it has protected uh, it has protected people either by giving them a year's notice, four months notice, relocation benefits. Um, that the Ellis Act would be gone. Um, we look at builders' fees for housing trust funds to produce housing, and um, don't see a future for that. Well, I mean. It's I hate, hate to keep dwelling on this because this is just such a uh, horrible news if we stay on this, but what's the impact on, uh, for example, local zoning laws or, or what's the impact on uh, homeowners and, and it, you know, if they're concerned about density in their neighborhood? Is, is there an impact from this initiative? Yeah, absolutely. In what way? Um, well, I think if you look at the environmental protections, you look at the zoning protections, you look at... Um, water storage, which we desperately need. All of these have been, all of these probable um, scenarios have been looked at by the, the various law firms that specialize in those areas of the law. And what they're finding is either that the, uh, that Prop 98 altogether would prohibit the taking of private property for personal uses, and that language applies to the private property that would be taken for the purpose of storing water that would then be subsequently used for personal drinking water and the like. So the, the way in which it's been drafted threatens things as basic as our water, our environment, our ability to reduce the carbon footprint, our ability to address so do, do I hear you right? Are you saying that if the state decides to build some extension of, of the aqueduct or something that, that supplies water to our city, that uh, this initiative might actually preclude them from grabbing some vacant land in the middle of the Sierras? And that is what I'm saying. <laughs> The water agencies, the major, major California water agencies and specialists have uh, written their opinion of that language. And while it may be, uh, it may have been careless drafting, 
the words of the words, and we both know that it's going to be up to the courts then if it passes to determine whether or not the state still has the ability to do that because it says it cannot be taken for um, furtherance of personal use. And there's nothing more personal than drawing a cup of water to drink. Wow. So, so even if even if somehow the state could prevail, it's going to cost millions and millions more than it normally would cost in order to uh, provide for the public drinking. That's correct. Drink, drinking water. That's correct. Because you probably remember with, and I mean, this is all obviously it's everyone looking at the possibility and. Nobody can look at a crystal ball, but we can look at those words. And we know that um, when the doctrine of eminent domain requires that anything that's taken for the public use requires just compensation, but then it goes on to expand that entire definition of what constitutes a taking, uh, we understand that we have, we are embedding in the California Constitution um, something that is far, far broader than anything anticipated when we saw Prop 90 and when we see, when we first saw um, this um, being circulated. Well, let me ask you another question. Does, does this initiative impact local zoning? For example, if a city wants to come in and say, you know, in this particular part of town, we're only going to have R1, we're only going to have residential units. Uh, have some of the people that looked at this concluded that this initiative might prevent cities from actually doing that kind of oh, thing? More than might. We think that wherever a city reduced the value of somebody's property or dictated the way in which that property um, could be used, that there was at least um, a credible lawsuit involved in it. And certainly, because we talk about open space, we talk, I mean, some of the, some of the most obvious kinds of, quote, takings. I mean, everybody in Tahoe is going to certainly say it's for the first time. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity to build the three-story, et cetera, et cetera. The Coastal Commission. Um, the, um, so if Donald Trump buys a house in my neighborhood and... He says, you know what, I want to put up Trump Towers West in the middle of Sunset Park. Um, and the city says, you know what, we really don't want a 200-story high-rise in the middle of Sunset Park. He's going to say, Prop 98 uh, seems like a taking, so you're going to have to compensate me. Is that, is that? That is, we think that's a very possible interpretation. Excluding the Donald Trump part. Excluding that. <laughs> you may suddenly find uh, Santa Monica very good. If I, if I may just read to you, first the Prop 98 talks about what constitutes a taking, and then it modifies that with a definition of private use, and it describes it as regulation of ownership, occupancy, or use of privately owned real property or associated property rights in order to transfer an economic benefit to one or more private persons at the expense of the property owner. And that's, if you look at the open space, if you look at almost anything, you are compelling a property owner to transfer some of the value of that property to one or more persons or to the public. And we think when you take the definition of, the expanded definition of a taking, and then what constitutes private use, which obviously is, the, um, is the, the key to the taking, since it would be for private use, we think the modifier in some ways is even more um, encompassing than the new definition of a taking. So... Well... If I'm hearing correctly, this initiative is going to severely potentially impact renters. It's going to severely impact people that do things like are concerned about environmental protection or drinking water. Or, and it, 
it's going to severely impact people that are concerned about overbuilding or density. Um, no question. So I'm trying to figure out who, who sponsored this initiative and why. That's a softball, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, if I can back up just a little tiny bit, um, because it gets grimmer when you look at um, a couple years ago when you had Prop 90 on the ballot. And um, the no on 90 um, groups raised $12 million. The um, yes on 90 raised $1 million. And we, um, w they had no campaign, and it was an outsider. You would probably remember somebody from out of state who didn't do anything to popularize it as a homegrown initiative. So, and even with that, it failed by 52% to 52 and some change to 47.6. Um, to wow. That's... You know, 12 to 1, no campaign, no homegrown. So it kind of empowered them. Yep. So now we have a homegrown initiative. We have... Well. Well. Signed yeah, off on people okay. that are living in California, I suppose. Well, homegrown in the, in, the, um, in the parlance of it's being sponsored by um, the, um, the Jarvis people. It's being paid for, as we well know, um, by um, about 85% of it by landlords and mobile home park owners. Um, we know that um, the, the way the money is coming in from the other side is on a formula basis. So it appears that mobile home park owners and landlords are tithing based upon the number of units they have, because at least we can detect the way in which the, uh, the size of the contributions that are being made by various sized landlords. That means there's a fair amount of money most likely out there. Um, we know that um, our, the opponents to 98 have raised 6.4 and that the sponsors have raised 3.2, but none of the major donors are in for serious money yet. The 6.2 that we raised is gone. That's what was spent to put 99 on the ballot. And 99 went on the ballot when the polls showed that people in California even a few years after um, the Kelo decision that gave, gave rise to this eminent domain um, firestorm, that, the, that people had that, that ardor to pass an eminent domain proposition had not, um, had not gone down at all. And what they, what they said, in essence, was, we will vote for 98 even though we know it's got something really bad in it because we want um, to do something about eminent domain. So it became clear that we had to put the money into um, running 99. You probably remember um, last time I was here was right after the legislature had killed the legislature's effort to put a 99 type proposition on the ballot. So here we are in September, and it, it was much, much more expensive than to have to go out and do the signature gathering to place 99 on the ballot. So it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a huge job ahead of us. Um, Excuse me, uh, Christine. Surely. I don't want to get you off here. But I understand that there's been a disinformation campaign confusing Proposition 98 with the education. Yes. Could, you, could you talk about that a little bit? I surely will. Thank um, you. The, it was uh, probably the end of week before last that it became clear within the education community that, the, um, that there was this very simple message that they were being instructed to carry 
in the middle of this budget fight that we're engaged in right now that would take somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six billion dollars out of the education budget. It's more good news I have to talk to you about. Um, and so the, the, um, what became their mantra was protect 98, protect 98. And that began spilling over. Um, it's difficult to know whether it arose naturally yeah. out of the 98 people, because in the Capitol for all the years, we have always called it the Prop 98 right. um, protection. And uh, every year we were talking about whether or not the trigger had to be pulled on Prop 98. Were we going to meet the Prop 98 guarantee? Kids need 98, protect children with Prop 98. And then suddenly you're dealing with that campaign that has, um, has been a part of the, um, the public uh, conversation for over, well over a decade. And so that disinformation or that um, confusion is what's the good 98 and what's the bad 98? I, Who should I be protecting? Mm -hmm. um, add to that or what preceded it was our extreme disappointment with the Attorney General because the title and summary we know is generally the only words that a vast proportion of the voters read before they vote on a proposition. And the title and summary, the title, is generally what's read. Maybe you get down a sentence or two into the summary, but Lord knows, even though I love these things, reading that stuff is, you know, watching paint dry. Um, so when there was a number of meetings first with um, the legislative analyst because we were um, presenting to her the fact that to find in her analysis that there was little cost for cities or um, counties, we argued and thankfully there was a lot of response um, from Santa Monica Rent Board because we had to gather very quickly um, the raw numbers of units, the, we had to factor in the replacement cost if all of those people were suddenly um, evicted from these units. Of course there's a, a very significant cost. It starts with homelessness. It starts with what happens to people that were in a unit that they could afford and it suddenly costs three times their Social Security or any of a number of other um, indices for what constitutes affordability. She didn't buy it. She still found that there was a de minimis cost, and that's what she sent over to um, Jerry Brown. And having worked for him and having known his, um, his awareness of housing, we had hoped that we were going, if you recall, he was the one and only governor that vetoed a rent control preemption bill in the late 70s. And so it, we hoped, but we hoped for not, because when he wrote the title and summary, or his, obviously his proposition unit wrote it, the title only dealt with um, eminent domain, and you drop down to about the third line in the summary before rent control is mentioned and it has a glancing mention as opposed to um, a full-on description. It seemed like the only thing you can do is go to court, went to court, and um, the judge, of course, provided, um, as he's supposed to, um, great deference to the Attorney General in uh, the way in which uh, the summary was drafted judge said, I would have probably drafted it differently if it were mine, if it were my responsibility, but found for the, uh, found for the government. So um, on that dismal note, it was encouraging 
to have the PPIC poll come out the middle of last week. Uh, they're obviously one of the most respected pollsters in California and are not part of the capital environment and are not part of the, um, the major uh, campaign consultant firms, and they look at land use and um, conditions in California on a frequent basis. And they released the poll last um, Friday morning. And what it found was that 53% of likely voters think that rent control is a good policy. And that, and 39% thought it was not. Um, which explains probably why when the next questions were asked about Prop 98, only 37% of them, of these likely voters of this very large sample, 37% um, of them said they would vote yes for Prop 98, and 41% said they would vote no. Now, what that leaves us is 22% undecided when we're a month away from the absentee ballots being dropped. So these four weeks and the work that um, the work that all of us are, are doing on our personal time, of course, um, is the kind of work that needs to ensure that, that, 20, that the trend that we're seeing, because undecideds more frequently break for the no side. But what we're up against is the June election, which is going to have Small turnout. Uh, yep, very, very small turnout. So it's almost like it's the handful of people from each precinct that go that are going to determine all of this that we've been that we've been discussing. And we can blame that small turnout on uh, Speaker Nunez and Senator Parada. We could, a among others. I was going to say there's. There's plenty to go around, but uh, yes, I moving the um, certainly moving the um, the presidential primary um, at a minimum um, altered the way in which the the June primary is going to play out because we don't have enough elections in one year. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I, I don't turn on my television out of fear any longer. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know what else to say about it, Mr. Chairman. Um, we at Western Center decided that ordinarily we look at a very um, broad panoply of issues that we're going to work on, and that's our, particularly in, in the legislature, and we decided this year that it was almost folly to spend time on things that might be overturned before we even got them into right. the second house of the, the legislature. That's not to say we didn't do anything, but... Um, well, it's, you know, as I said earlier, I just, I, I don't see if you're a homeowner, if you're concerned about your, your family's health, and of course if you're a renter, I don't see how anyone in any of those groups could support this 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 initiative it just seems mind-boggling to me how can you drink the water yeah how can you anticipate that your neighborhood is not going to have mixed uses in it um, the notion that we would be fighting about height limits and setbacks and side yards any longer which gets everybody up in arms we wouldn't be talking about any of them anymore because we're um, we're taking somebody else's property for our for the personal enjoyment of the neighbors living around and that concept seems to go back several thousand years because it, as far as i'm concerned it's the end of public comedy that's just um can you tell us about prop 99 what, what what's um prop 99 is extremely straightforward it does not deal with anything 
except embedding in the Constitution um, the protection from taking by eminent domain of owner-occupied housing. Doesn't it has no other? I mean, it's it's a few sentences. It amends the Constitution and just says, "There, um, your person, your home, is um, nobody, no government can put their hands on it again." Obviously, you can come to a fair price if that's what you want to do, but so it requires full and fair compensation to anyone that is that's right. That, that, that vacant property I was talking mm -hmm. about in the Sierras that. Uh, uh, the, the state may need for its its canal. Uh, it, it, it allows that owner of that property to meet with the state and get fair compensation for that. Well, or not at all. Oh. Here's my price. You want to take it? Here's what it costs you. Wow. The, the one thing 99 has in it is a poison pill. And it says if 99 gets one more vote than 98, it's, it takes um, precedence. It becomes law. So, so if somebody is concerned about eminent domain or losing their house or losing their property, they can vote for 99. They don't have to worry about it having some hidden agenda that's going to impact the renters down the street or zoning or any of those things. That's right. And if they're concerned about it, and if they vote for 99, and if 98 passes, but as long as 99 gets one more vote than 98, 99 will be the law, and 98 will have no effect. That's right. And we'll have a simple, clear, straightforward um, requirement in the Constitution that says no state agency can take your property. So it sounds to me like 99 would completely eliminate any of the concerns that people were talking about with the Keogh decision. That's right. Which makes this this issue even more um, confusing in terms of why would there why would there even be a difference? Uh, why if, if you want eminent domain um, clarified, cleaned up, um, vote for 99, and you don't have to worry that there is any secondary and tertiary issues that will flow from it. But 98 seems to be the the province of mobile home park owners and landlords well, and well, why didn't the Jarvis Group and the the other people supporting 98 just support an initiative like 99 in the first place? Well, initially, um, when we were working on the um, constitutional amendment in the legislature, the Jarvis Group was working with us, and um, we we worked together. Let's not say it was an easy process, or it was one that was entirely um, clear, but Jarvis had come on board with putting together the constitutional amendment. What they wanted, and what was included in that constitutional amendment, was protection of churches. It, was, um, it protected small businesses to some extent. It, prote it protected ag land. And so it had these um, the Farm Bureau, a number of, of major um, organizations were involved in the crafting of that. Um, right within a couple weeks before the vote, it began sliding in the opposite direction as the Republican, the major players within the Republican Party, their polling, um, they began gathering around we don't want um, anything on the ballot except what uh, was being circulated at that time, which was the Jarvis petition. In 98? Mm -hmm. So there was a few months of seemingly working together, and then there was this signature gathering, which they, from the very beginning, had said, it could break down in the legislature. We don't want to be... Uh, we don't want to be in a position where we have to get the signatures in very short time frame. So we are going to be circulating the petition. And all of these various understandings were there, and then it collapsed um, sometime a few weeks before the deadline. And not a single Republican voted for the 
um, ACA 8, which was carried by um, De La Torre. And it was, a, it was a very thorough, broad piece of legislation, but it did not completely take care of the small business person, and it did not cover every type of church. The definition wasn't as broad as some would have liked. Um, but you, you would have had to be in that room with those people that made the decision to know exactly what it, what it was framed by. 33 years of doing this, and I have a, I have a pretty good idea. But. Oh. Well, um, you brought us a lot of discouraging news. <laughs> but we also have a month of work to make sure that that number that we're looking at right now, 37%, um, remains. And that's a, if I were running uh, the 98 campaign, um, those numbers would not make me uh, very sanguine. On the other hand, if I had the major mobile home park owners, um, we know that Sam Zell owns 27 of them here, and that just one of them, the value of one of them, uh, post-98 could, could fund the entire election. Uh, we haven't seen the kind of contributions that seem to be out there waiting. And you Jeez. don't do your buy of until the last minute when you're looking at these kinds of things. So you think there's a lot of money that's waiting in the wings? Yes. So our, our defenses are the usual ones, which is informing people. Bad 98 hurts renters, seniors. Good 98 the legislature is dealing with. It's the money for education. But boy, getting people's, getting people's attention long enough to understand. Now, we also know that when there's confusion, voters tend to vote oh. against everything. But is a voter going to be in the booth? Are they going to get to 98 and at least read the first three words? Because if you see eminent domain instead of education spending, that's, that's going to be an important piece of of what people are going to have to do when they go into the booth is just to remember, no on 98 and yes on 99. I don't remember who said it. 98 is one we hate. 99 is fine. As far as the 98 education, that's not on the ballot. No, it but is there not. Isn't it, there is this confusion that's arising, but we what, need to tell people that the 98 they're talking about as far as education is not being voted on. That's right. Yeah. But what they're hearing, because there's these town hall meetings right. all over California, we have somewhere between 6 and $8 billion to cut out of the budget that we're just beginning to review. Right. And the governor's proposal right now is that half of that cut comes out of education. So when, when these different meetings are being held, they're saying protect 98. That's what I Because heard. 98 yeah. is what requires the legislature to mm. abide by the spending formula that's right. been in place. And if they suspend the 98 formula, they get, then can take all of this education right. money. So they're hearing a lot more about protect 98 right. in their communities then they're hearing about these two propositions. Who's conducting those meetings? Um, primarily the educators, the parents. Um, there's any number of groups that have gotten together on statewide basis, on regional basis, to, um, to really push back um, and encourage the increase in taxes. Because people understand if, if we have this kind of 
um, if we've got this kind of a deficit that we have to do something, we, we can't write checks to the schools sure. to run them. So what we're, to some extent, what we are, are stuck with is hearing 98 being repeated again and again and again as something that has to be protected. Well, I'm just wondering if those organizations are running their meetings or whoever it is, I don't know why, you know, ideally, if they would just change their slogan to save our schools or, or you know, you know. But you know what they've gotten, of course. Over 10 years, 98 has taken on this very positive mantra. Um, they're not, they're probably the best we could do with them is not ask them to, um, to bury that slogan because sure. none of us would in, a, in the real world, right? But for them to talk about um, there's this other 98 that will hurt our children, hurt our parents, hurt our grandparents, and we have to remember the 98 on the ballot is bad. Well, the budget, the budget discussions, mm -hmm. unfortunately, they're probably not going to be resolved before June. No. <laughs> they're going to probably just be heating up around June. That's right. We're, we're, we're looking at a long summer and fall. The, the 98, you know, people are well-intentioned, the, the 98 school people. I yes. don't, oh, I, I, mean, I don't mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't, they don't mean any harm. It's just I heard from three or four people directly about the confusion at 98. And I think a lot of people are not aware of the, so we really need to. Because 98 for over a decade has, has been, been a great. very positive right. Protection. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that was this week's um, heartburn. <laughs> well, do you have any good news for us? I'm thinking. <laughs> um, Actually, I think you brought us a lot of good news in connection with the initiatives. I mean, the fact that there is um, that that support is only at the level where it's at now, I think, is mm -hmm. is very favorable news. Mm -hmm. Because, it is. Because people haven't started really thinking about the election yet. They just barely got, well, we're not, are we really over the last, the last election? Or? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I think the PPIC poll um, was superb news. And I'm not sure that even a lot of money coming on the yes on 98 side um, convinces people when we've got the numbers to show it's being financed exclusively by two groups that don't get very high marks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, because of what they've done to mobile home parks over the last year and trying to convert them to condominiums and people that have been forced out or fearful of being forced out and the, the fact that um, housing right now is such a, a tough issue. Everybody in a position of knowing or personally experiencing a foreclosure and having a greater appreciation that protecting your home is so important. I mean, we've got an, quite a few rich symbols right now that homeowners and renters um, can coalesce around. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's, you can't buy things, I don't think, um, even with a lot of money uh, when your message is don't fo vote for 99 because all it does is protect your home. home. It needs right. to do all these other things. I think that's a little bit, I think that's a very tough sell. Particularly when, you know, we now have the California Chamber of Commerce opposing 98. Oh. I mean, when you start to see some of these groups, um, the agricultural groups that you always think of as um, very conservative in positions they take. Well, they need water. <laughs> sure. So they've got, they've got a, a dog in this fight for, for the first time. So 